Welcome to Caregiving Club On Air. This podcast is dedicated to the millions of family caregivers who want wellness tips and self-care solutions, who seek expert advice, and who want news about healthy aging and how to create well home design in our forever homes. I'm Sherry Snelling, a corporate gerontologist, author, and educator, a TV interviewer, host, and news commentator. I'm joining you from Southern California, where our interviews and news take us all across the country to explore the many ways to help you on your caregiving journey and to lift you up here at Caregiving Club On Air. Welcome back to Caregiving Club On Air and our episode on brain food, books, and creating cozy reading nooks. I'm Sherry Snelling. I'm your host, and I'm really excited to introduce our guest interview today. This is someone I've wanted to interview for a long time, and it's Bonnie Kaplan. She wrote a magnificent book called The Better Brain, um, Overcome Anxiety, Combat Depression, Reduce ADHD, and Stress with Nutrition. And you know, when I read it, it really hit me. It's one of the best books out there about how nutrition not only impacts our physical health, but also our mental and emotional health. So that's going to be a fantastic interview coming up. Now, also, we want to recognize caregiver wellness. And on March 4th, we have National Unplug Day. So we've talked about Huga before, which is the Danish term for cozy. And we're going to talk about one aspect of Huga, which is reading, how reading actually improves our health. And we're in our well home design news, we're talking a little bit about how do you create these cozy reading nooks within your home. And we've got lots of really great ideas to share with you on that today. And while we're on the subject of books, you know, usually we do our resources section and pop culture. What we've done for this episode is really special. We have a list of books that we love that are all on the subject of caregiving, but different aspects of caregiving. And it's called our Caregiving Club Book Lovers List. So what we're going to do is we're going to highlight some of the great books that we love and the categories that we have. And we're going to have a link on our episode guide page to all of those wonderful books that hopefully will help you out in your caregiving journey. And of course, as always, we're going to end with our Me Time Monday wellness hack. And this episode, we're going to focus on how to eat the rainbow, how to adopt a Mediterranean style diet for living longer, how to love the sunshine diet, and also how to eat like the French. So let's dive now into our caregiver wellness news. Before we go into our wonderful interview with Bonnie Kaplan, the author of The Better Brain, for our caregiver wellness news, I wanted to share with you a couple of really great resources and also some research that has been done. But let's start with these wonderful resources. And since we're going to talk to Bonnie about how brain health is so tied to nutrition, a couple of these resources are, one is something called Brain Guide. It is an online resource that was launched during the pandemic. And you can find it at mybrainguide.org, O-R-G. And what is really wonderful about this site, and you can find it in both English and Spanish, is that it offers not only a wealth of information and articles about brain health, and also how to really understand the difference in just normal cognitive decline as we age, as opposed to things like what we call mild cognitive impairment, which is MCI, which is different from Alzheimer's disease and the the stages of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And then they have this wonderful tool. So it is a survey that you can take or your older loved one can take, or even your kids could take. And what it does is it gives you an assessment of your cognitive performance and status. And it's not a diagnostic tool, but what they wanted to do with this survey tool is to, first of all, get everybody more engaged in what brain health is all about. And then they personalize the resources and the articles that they push to you once they see your survey results so that you can really start immersing yourself in this brain health. But also, if there's a concern over maybe some things that they saw on the survey, it's a tool that you can take with you to talk to your doctor about. 
And we certainly know that people who have Alzheimer's disease, once they are finally diagnosed, have typically been living with the disease for 10 to 15 years, and they miss some of the warning signs. So again, if we're concerned about our own cognitive performance or our loved one's cognitive performance, it's a great survey to take because it gives you the first stepping stone towards having that conversation with your doctor and figuring out if maybe there is something more serious going on. And, you know, one of the the missions, if you will, about this site is they really want to create this movement around brain health that is very similar to what we saw with breast cancer back in the seventies when women started getting more educated about breast health and started doing self exams. Now the self exams themselves um, were just the prelude or just maybe the first step to then go get a mammogram or talk to your doctor because you were concerned maybe about a lump um, or something that had changed, but it was all because we were getting more educated about breast health. So this is the same kind of mission, same kind of movement. We all need to become a little bit more educated about our brain health. So check that out at brainguide.org. Now, um, the organization Women Against Alzheimer's, which is part of the large network called Us Against Alzheimer's, they also have a 30-day challenge that's really tailored mostly for women. Again, you, you know, if you're a man out there listening, you can also take it and also kids can take it. But it's a 30-day challenge called Be Brain Powerful. And what it does is, again, it's a survey and they, they can even take the results because they're connected to the Brain Guide a group so they can take the results from your brain guide survey and port that into your 30 day challenge, or you can just go take the 30 day challenge survey on your own and separately. But what it does is it's, it gives you then information about the six pillars of health, which were formulated by the Cleveland clinic. And of course, nutrition is a big part of that. And so what they'll do is they'll give you a lot of tips, resources, exercises, different things that you can do and different recipes and meals that are tailored to you around brain health and nutrition. So really wonderful resources. And I definitely recommend that you check those out. Now, March is National Nutrition Month, as we mentioned, but it's also National Reading Month. So we wanted to highlight some of the scientific studies and research that's being done on there, uh, out there about how reading really impacts our physical and emotional and mental health. So I wanted to read uh, to you a few of these studies that I researched and came across, and I thought they were really interesting. So the first study is that readers of books, particularly fiction books, um, actually have higher levels of empathy. And the researchers believe that this is based on the fact that readers get immersed in the characters and the challenges, and they start to become sympathetic and empathetic to the beliefs and the struggles that their character is going through in the book. And this then translates into everyday life. So we're definitely increasing our empathy. And, you know, one of the other benefits of reading books is, you know, for a lot of us, and I know I'm, I'm in this group. I, I'm a solo reader. I love escaping into a good book and reading on my own. But, you know, a lot of people have been in, included in book clubs and they've really participated and loved book clubs for years. And that's a social interaction based around reading that's really important. We know that social health is one of the key ingredients in our overall physical and mental health. So it's just something to think about. Reading is one of those ways to get us into more of these social activities. Now, the second benefit of reading is that it builds our vocabulary. So there's something called the Matthew effect. Now, many of you may have heard of this. It actually is based on research that was done back in the 1960s. And the Matthew effect is actually a term that refers to the biblical verse um, Matthew 13, 12. And it says this, whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them. And so if, if I translate that a little bit into some of the gerontology research and things that we look at in aging, it's similar to the use it or lose it effect where we know that if we're not exercising our brain, if we're not doing things like reading um, and other things that are going to give us better brain health or better overall, you know, spiritual, emotional health, then we will start to lose that. And we know all of these elements are so, again, they're, they're the key ingredients to helping us all live longer. So it's, it's definitely something that you want to take a look at. And And again, going back to the book club reference, you know, one of the great 
spiritual and social activities that I know a lot of my friends are involved in. And it's so important are things like Bible study, where you are reading the Bible and then you're having conversations and interpreting it in different ways. And I know this is done in other faiths as well, but again, it's that social interaction based around your faith and based around reading, which can be really um, helpful to your overall health. Now, one of the other benefits that I came across is the National Institute on Aging recommends reading books, particularly um, as we get older, to help slow cognitive decline. Now, there's still a lot of science and research being done to exactly show a causal effect that reading will slow cognitive decline. But one of the things that we know is that there was a study that was done. um, It was what we call a longitudinal study. So it was done over 12 years with the same group, the same cohort of 3,600 people. And what they found is that those people who read books survived around two years longer than those who either didn't read books or who only read magazines and online news sources. Very interesting, isn't it? I think it's because, again, a book will pull you in and capture your imagination and get you focused. Whereas sometimes when we're reading a magazine um, article or maybe online, we're kind of skimming it. You know, we're reading the headline and we're moving on. Books are, are actually a little bit more of that immersive experience. So interesting to think that we might live longer if we're reading books. And then finally, you know, we know that reading can lower your stress level. It is a good escape. Um, There was a 2009 study that found that 30 minutes of reading lowered blood pressure and heart rate and feelings of psychological distress just as effectively as 30 minutes of yoga or humor and laughter did. So, you know, we know that the benefits of yoga and the benefits of humor, and we're going to be talking about those things in future episodes, but we know that those are health benefits, but now we can also look to reading as being one of those health benefits. So I mentioned in the intro that we're very excited here at Caregiving Club because when we started Caregiving Club over a decade ago, we created what we called our book lovers um, reading list. And that was a, a series of books that we thought were really helpful to caregivers out there who were needing support, needing good information, or just needing to recognize that they were not alone. And so we're excited to update our list. And now we've got all these different categories for you. We're going to have a link on our episode guide page, but it's it's everything from if you're caring for a spouse, if you're caring for someone with Alzheimer's, that's a different category. If you're going through grief or end of life, that's a category. We also have children's books to help children understand things like Alzheimer's and dementia. We have a lot of books on happiness and sleep science and just overall brain health. Um, and, you know, just, just a host of things that we know that caregivers encounter. And again, I think part of it is hopefully you'll find at least something on our list that's helpful to you. And it gives you that sense of connecting with the larger community to know that there are people out there. We also, of course, included some celebrity memoirs that uh, are specifically about some celebs out there. And, you know, for instance, like um, Kimberly Williams Paisley or Dan Gasby and B. Smith, who recently passed away, they actually wrote a memoir about her early onset Alzheimer's, how, what both of them were going through um, when she was first diagnosed. So we, we've got all of those on there too. And I'm sure that you'll be able to find something that will help you out. So with all of that, Let's now go into our wonderful interview with Bonnie Kaplan, who really maps out for us how important nutrition is when it comes to our emotional health and our mental health. Two things that we saw in surveys that caregivers really struggled with during the pandemic with COVID and caregiving and just in general. And I think Bonnie's going to be able to give us some really great tips and resources on how our nutrition may be able to help us all out. Here is our interview with Bonnie. So we're seeing increasing rates of depression and mental health issues seems to be the topic of the day. In fact, the National Alliance for Mental Mental Illness states that one in five adults are challenged with a mental health issue today. And we know that 8 million family caregivers are caring for someone who has a mental health issue. So I am thrilled today to have uh, Bonnie Kaplan, who is our guest. And Bonnie is the uh, co-author of this wonderful book called The Better Brain, Overcome Anxiety, 
uh, combat depression, reduce ADHD and stress with nutrition, which is really interesting. I think it's something we obviously are not focused enough on. And as we are talking about brain health, I think that um, this is going to be a really exciting interview. So let me tell you just really quickly about Bonnie. Uh, Bonnie is the professor emerita in the Cummings School of Medicine at the University of Calgary. Uh, her work uh, and, and all of her research has really been focused around including nutrition knowledge in the care of people with mental health challenges. And in fact, last year, she was chosen as one of the top 70 over 70 in Calgary, partly for her book, uh, The Better Brain. And so, Bonnie, it's, it's a thrill to have you here and welcome to Caregiving Club on Air. Thank you so much, really, Sherry. I'm delighted to be here and to learn more about your work. Yes. Well, you know, we have um, all kinds of listeners. In fact, we, our age group that we're typically, our audience is um, between the age of 25 all the way up to 60. And a lot of our discussions are around wellness. And so this is a perfect topic for today. Um, you know, one of the things that really struck me about your book, which, by the way, is, is phenomenal. And it's, it's important, not just for people, I think, who have mental health issues or their loved ones, but anybody who's looking for better brain health. But you were writing it right as the pandemic hit. And, you know, we've seen so many articles and surveys talking about this increase in depression and, you know, caregivers and emo emotional health and burnout. Um, but you say we actually don't have more stress, more anxiety in our lives today than previous generations. And this lack of resiliency is a real issue. Tell us what you mean by that. Well, it's very clear that my grandparents who lived through World War I, uh, the Dust Bowl, the Depression, World War II, the Holocaust, uh, and, and prior to that, we grew up with stories of the pandemic of 1917, 1918. Their life was not easier. My life has been easier. And yet in my generation, just in my lifetime, Sherry, we've seen the prevalence of mental challenges, as, as you quoted, um, become one out of five. How, what do we compare that to? When I know that when I was in training in the 1960s, that it was one, uh, it was uh, less than 3%. So less than three in a hundred. So to go from 3% to 20% in my lifetime, that's what's really crazy. And the other thing, I mean, there are lots of reasons. I don't think it's increased stress. I think that there are a lot of other reasons for the problems, and, and we're only going to talk about one of them, but I want your listeners to know there's nothing more complex than human behavior. But in the same time period, as a society, we have chosen to cut our nutrient intake in half. And I can give you a link with information about that. You'd love but that. The, the nutrients... Um, that Americans are consuming now, it is uh, the latest NHANES data, that's your national, I'm sorry, I keep saying your because I'm in Canada. <laughs> so I'm originally an American born and raised in Ohio, trained in the States, but it's your country. Now. <laughs> <laughs> are the most recent ones from NHANES, that's the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey that's been going on since 1971. 57% of adults, 67% in, in uh, children, that what's going into their mouths is not real food. It's ultra processed chemicals. So that is a big change from when I was a child. Anyway, we ate real food. Well, and, and I agree with you. You know, I, I find it so interesting. I think it's a, a bit of a conundrum because we are much more educated health consumers these days. We know so much more about wellness and nutrition, and yet, uh, you know, the increasing rates of obesity in children, and again, some of the emotional and mental health issues that we're seeing. You know, a lot of what your book focuses on is the power of micronutrients to really treat mental illnesses, whether it's uh, bipolar disorder or the schizoid spectrum or ADHD or autism, even Alzheimer's. And I, I would love for you to explain, you know, we know we're an over-medicated society. Um, you're really saying nutrition should be an alternative solution that we just aren't looking at. Um, tell us a little bit more about the power of those micronutrients. Sure. First, I just want to correct one word. Sure. I don't think that nutrition should be the alternative. It okay. is not an alternative medicine. We are made up of nutrients. Nutrition is the foundation of our resilience. It's the foundation of what enables our cells to grow. It's the foundation of what 
enables our cells to communicate with each other. That's explained at, at a very simple general public level in chapter two of our book. And so uh, it's it, we're not anti-medication. We just don't think we should be a medication first society. We should be first all of the lifestyle improvements that we can make. And nutrition is very underestimated for brain health. Maybe I should do a little um, definition here because I think you used, or maybe I used the word micronutrients or right. we both did. So let me just explain something. Our society is not short on a lot of the macronutrients. Macronutrients are fats. Heaven only knows we're getting enough fats. <laughs> not fats necessarily, not the, you know, the polyunsaturated omega-3s, but um, we're getting a lot of fats, proteins, sugars, good grief, carbohydrates, simple and simple carbs are sugars. We're getting plenty of those. Those are macronutrients. Um, we use the term micronutrients. Everybody uses micronutrients as a slightly differently, but my co-author, Julia Recklage and I use it pretty consistently to refer to vitamins and minerals. I used to say, I got tired of saying minerals and vitamins, vitamins and minerals. So we just say <laughs> micronutrients, but in fact, it's a pretty accurate characterization of what they are. And what they do is like everything else, they build cells, but they enable our cells to talk to each other. If you don't have more serotonin, one thing you can do is take an SSRI medication, but you could also instead first try giving the pathways in your brain the micronutrients they need to manufacture serotonin because we cannot eat serotonin. I, right. I often ask audiences this, like, well, what are you eating to get your serotonin or your dopamine? And you get these blank looks in before we were on zoom. <laughs> I can't see what they're <laughs> right. showing. Um, but really uh, people haven't thought about this before, but we can't eat it. We have to eat the precursors and then we have to have lots and lots of micronutrients on board to enable our clever little brains to convert those other chemicals into the neurotransmitters that we've all heard about. And I think I went out. No, no this was no, this is great. It, this is wonderful. And you know, it, kind of part of this is we do lack our, our education as these health consumers has lacked in how our brains do work and what does make our brain healthy. And as you said, it's the driver for all these things. You know, when we get back to the medication and the drug therapies, um, and, and I do understand you're not anti-medication, but the medications aren't really solving the problem. And in some ways, maybe they're even masking the problem. Um, but you're saying the nutrition can actually maybe even help solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And so tell us a little bit about, um, you know, a couple of, of the cases that you and Julia were researching and how those ended, because I think they're really interesting. And you include so many in the book, but give, give us like one example of how nutrition really played a role in addressing mental health. Sure. I'll give you one where we ended up getting a health economist involved. So we also showed that we can save uh, in that particular case, 97% of the healthcare dollar, which is, are there any policymakors listening? <laughs> to this? So this is a case, and this one's published. Um, we call this boy Andrew, obviously not his real name, but he was um, a child with a lot of anxiety as a child, as a young child. And um, there were other ways in which he was kind of different I, that I won't go into. And so he'd been worked up by our genetics clinic twice, trying to figure out if there was some syndrome here and they never figured it out. Then when he was 10, he became so agitated and so anxious that um, he was hospitalized. And by then he was having hallucinations he was really, it was a childhood psychosis, um, he, hallucinations, delusions. Um, he believed that he had committed adultery at the age of 10. And so he met criteria for obsessive compulsive disorder because he began praying obsessively and he couldn't stop. He believed that he had killed someone. I mean, it's just, you know, a delusional thinking. Right. He was in a tertiary care pediatric health unit where very experienced psychiatrists tried for six months to find some medication that would help him, and they could not. He was on a lot of medication trials, and so he was sent home. So in a nutshell, what happened then is that his family heard about our, at that time, this was like 2008, so it was still pretty early days of 
generating a lot of research showing what micronutrients could do. And they asked their psychiatrist, could they try one of the multi-nutrient formulas that we had been studying positive results with? And we collected data. Uh, I was called in, I didn't know the family, but called in then to help out with the data. And that's what we published as his, and we tracked him into the age of 11 as his hallucinations disappeared, his OCD behavior disappeared. He still was a somewhat anxious child. So then he went and learned about meditation and relaxation, etc. There's a place for a lot of different things, you know, in our lives. It's just that the nutrition really gave him a leg up. And um, we, we still are in touch with him. And that was a long time ago. And he's able to work part time. And he has other problems, as I told you, but um, he's not psychotic anymore. And the health economist showed that the cost of the micronutrients was only about 3%. Now, the difference is here in Canada, the health care, that's, we paid for that. Right. But the nutrients, there's nobody yet, no government yet willing to pay for that, even, even in a peer reviewed published case study. So the family has to buy them. Which is amazing when you talk I about mean, the cost benefit, you know, for so much that, that is outlaid right now in terms of mental health and some of the things that we have to address. You know, you also touch upon the conversation between nutrition and you talk a little bit about the Mediterranean diet, which I've written a lot about. And I, I love that diet. You know, there's so many fad diets every other week and this one seems to stick. But tell us a little bit about, first of all, the Mediterranean diet and how that optimizes or is optimal for brain health. And then how do you look at nutrition and the micronutrient regimen that you use with mental health patients? Oh, okay. Well, I'll kind of mix all that together, Sherry. We, we uh, try in the book, especially, we try not ever to say that we're recommending a Mediterranean diet because nobody knows what that is. Right. A Mediterranean style diet. Okay. It's, basically, it's what Dr. Andrew Weil said years and years ago, eat true food. And then Michael Pollan came along and said, eat uh, real food or whole food. Anyway, it's a whole foods kind of diet. And that is what we as a society has gotten away from. I mean, that's what I was saying is that over half of what our society is putting in their mouths no longer meets the criteria for being a real food. It's ultra processed chemicals. Mm -hmm. So um, the very first level, we strongly recommend that every clinic, every individual learn how to um, cook from scratch and teach everyone in the family how to cook inexpensive. You say, by the way, there's one very clear trial that showed that you'll save 20% of your food budget. There's a myth out there that eating healthy food is more expensive. And I always say it's only true if you're eating steak and lobster every week, you know, right, right. but if learning how to cook with um, beans and legumes and lentils and everything, lentils are so quick and so easy in there. You can get 7 million recipes in less than one second on Google. Um, and we have a, a chapter in our book of recipes, by the way. Um, then you will save money. So um, where we sit and, the, and what we propose in chapter 12, which is our vision of the future, is a sequence. Number one, though, feed your brain. Let's first feed our brains. And that means giving our brains real food. And yes, there are problems with nutrient density in the soil, but let's not go there for now because I don't think you have time for me to do that. We have a half a chapter of the book on the, the soil microbiome, but it's something to be aware of. But do the best that you can. Um, eat as much whole, good, healthy food. And that will replace the ultra processed chemicals that you've gotten used to eating. And then somewhere down the line, if that is not bringing you optimal mental health, it's possible that you are one of the people who has inherited a need for more micronutrients for optimizing your brain health than other people. And then chapter 11 of the book actually goes through all of the empirically studied multi-nutrient formulas in the whole world, um, which have been shown to affect mental, not physical, but mental health. That's the piece that we keep neglecting is our brain health. Yeah. So that's the sequence is first eat better, 
And of course, do all the other things, exercise and right. you know, family support it's, and social support. It's a balance and, of a lot of things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you know, consider the supplements. Yeah. It's fascinating because I, I worked with a, a doctor, Dr. David Agus. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but at a medical center out here in Southern California. And um, he talked about when you go in the grocery store, only shop around the fringes. Don't go into the internal aisles because that's where all the packaged, you know, processed food is, which I thought was really interesting. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of getting close to time, Bonnie, but I wanted to ask you, so when it comes to coming up with the right uh, regimen, let's say, um, and you talk a lot about, it's not just one vitamin supplement, you know, um, it's a combination. And so tell us a little bit about that. And then also, for our listeners who might be caring for a loved one who has a mental illness or they themselves are feeling a little bit more burnout and emotional distress, how do they go about finding and creating this micronutrient regimen either for themselves or, or who can guide them on that? Yeah. So this is where it gets really tricky, Sherry, because you can go and buy a lot of things over the counter and, and they're not going to hurt you. And they might be a little bit of, you know, help to you. Um, I would say, look for the broadest spectrum possible, not just vitamins, but also minerals. And there are roughly 30 that our brain needs at all times, in addition to the essential fatty acids, fish oils and stuff, but there are roughly 30 minerals and vitamins. So the higher the number that you can get, the better. Then it becomes a question of, first of all, are you dealing with someone who is already on a psychiatric medication? Because if you then go to one of the formulas that has been studied that we describe in, in chapter 11, they are much higher dosage, but they're still safe. They're below all of the federal regulations for tolerable upper levels. You know, they're safe, but they are, uh, you know, the most of the over-counter ones are really, really tiny, tiny amounts. Okay. They're right. not even RDA. So um, the research ones are higher level levels, higher doses. But that means that the medication that you used to, let's say you, I don't know if you're on a psychiatric medication, but as <laughs> any kind of antidepressant. No, anti but some days I feel like I should be. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> right. Yes. I, I won't go there. <laughs> first, first, try nutrition. But let's say you were taking an antidepressant, Sherry. If you took started taking one of these higher level formulas that have been shown to have an impact in improving mental health, what used to be an appropriate medication dose for you can become an overdose very quickly. And that's a good news story. It means that you can get along on lower doses of your medications. And most of the medications have some unpleasant side effects and nutrients never have unpleasant side effects. They only have good side effects, improving sleep and bowel movements and everything, you know? So um, it's a good news story for you, but um, it's, it can be dangerous if you don't learn how to gradually increase and watch for overdose. Mm -hmm. Now, I, we have worked mostly, and by we now, I'm talking about all the micronutrient researchers who study multinutrient formulas um, that we cover in the book outside of Europe. And we have used uh, formulas made in Canada. And these researchers are in Canada, the US, and my co authors group in New Zealand, which is very, very busy. And they're all studying these formulas made in Alberta. So in our book and on my website, oh man, I mentioned my website because you can find everything we've said on my website and all the resources you wanted. May I say that? Absolutely. And we'll also include that on our website episode guide page, but to, to tell us where we can find more information. Okay. Definitely. Well, there are too many Bonnie Kaplan's in the world. So my website had to use my middle initial Sherry. Okay. Which Okay. okay, so bonniejkaplan.com. And you can find the two companies there. And they are little family run businesses. And they have people on the phones who will talk to you and sort out what medications you're on and how to do a cross titration with the micronutrients. They will first want to work with your physician, your prescriber, if it is at all possible. And they're educating lots and lots of prescribers. Um, but you know, sometimes you run into prescribers who are not interested in nutrition because they haven't learned about it in school. Right. So I had I had one black, uh, little quick question for you. Um, somebody had emailed me and said, I'm really interested in probiotics. So what, what are your thoughts just quickly on probiotics? 
Well, we cover that in the book too. We we try to restrict our comments to what's been shown scientifically. Both of us are scientists. Unlike all the other nutrition books out there, we're scientists who have done this work ourselves, and but we want to translate it for the general public. So in a nutshell, there is not strong evidence yet that probiotics help with mental health. However, it's not going to hurt you. It, the problem is it's right now, people don't really know which probiotics, which organisms should go into the probiotics, which ones will help you, which ones will help somebody else, which ones are going to be more likely to affect absorption of nutrients for brain function. So it's a little bit like a, as we used to say in Ohio, a pig in a poke, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> It's not exactly, but it's certainly some people get immediate relief from GI, you know, their gut symptoms. So right. that's a suggestion that they might absorb their nutrients better if right. they're making their gut work better. Right. Well, Bonnie, again, I, I could talk to you for hours. I know our listeners are probably, but, you know, buying your book and reading your book, is going to be the best solution, I think, for our listeners out there, because it's so wonderful. And as you said, it's all based in, in, science, but it's, it's written in a way that it's very easy to understand. What, what would be your last message for our listeners thinking about brain health and, and mental illness? Okay, so I do want to say something in relationship to our book. I always say I'm not my motivation is not to sell lots of books, I just want to change the way mental health is treated. And so maybe if your listeners, any of them have are involved with any policymakers, and want to connect me in some way, I'm available. But I do want to say that I am so tired of people saying, oh, I've read a lot of nutrition books. This is not a nutrition book, folks. It's, you know, there are so many books out there that'll tell you how to eat a Mediterranean diet. Eat the, I call them shake the, shake a finger in your face books. <laughs> eat this, don't eat that, eat the, but they don't tell you why. Right. And you cannot change human behavior by saying, do this, do that. And our book explains what the nutrients are doing in your brain. And we review the scientific data and we give you lots of stories. And I think people come away feeling a lot more empowered than they do being told, do this, do that. Well, I love that as a message. That's that's one of the things that I've tried to do with, um, we have something called the Me Time Monday program, which is about seven elements of our life where we can find better wellness and balance. And, and it's exactly that. It's not the do this, it's why should you get more sleep? You know, how does that affect your brain? I think when we can start to educate people more about how the brain functions and then how that really Im impacts so much of what's going on with our overall health. That's my mission. I, I want to get from the youngest ages to learn about how your brain really works. So Bonnie, thank you so much. It's just been a fantastic conversation. And again, I want to let people know. So The Better Brain is the book and it's bonniejkaplan.com where they can find more information. And, and Bonnie, thank you. It's just been an honor to have you on today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Sherry. You're quite delightful to talk to. And I wish you all the best in the work that you're doing. Great. You too. Take care. So what's that wonderful interview with Bonnie Kaplan? I mean, she's just so full of wonderful information. I've got to tell you, check the book out. Because if you're really interested in this topic of brain health and nutrition for a host of mental health and emotional health issues, I think you're going to find it really, really insightful and, and an easy read. You know, she's she's a brilliant PhD, but um, Bonnie and, and her co-author really wrote it in a way that it's really easy to read. So um, also my producer just said in my ear, you forgot to mention during the book lovers you know, promo that we did that our list also includes cookbooks for caregiving, specifically for caregiving. So I just wanted to mention, we've got tons of um, wonderful books on that book lovers list, but now let's change to well home design news. And, you know, um, March being national nutrition month and national reading month. There's also another celebration that we have in March and that's on March 4th, which is national unplug day. This is one that's made just for me. I love this national unplug day. So, um, as we've mentioned before, you know, we know that one of the um, top, if not the top trend in well home design news for 2022 is wellness. And it's all about creating wellness spaces, uh, making sure that our environment
and certainly support our wellness and health needs. And last episode, we talked a little bit about sanctuary spaces and we just touched upon things like reading notes, but I wanted to go a little bit deeper dive on that because, you know, this episode, of course, is all about books and reading and reading nooks. And so I wanted to give you some tips into what we're thinking about and some ideas that we have in creating these little nooks. And, you know, um, we know that Huga, I've mentioned this many, many times, there's a component of huga, which is co- coziness in Danish, um, that really is about grabbing a book, curling up next to a fire, or during the summer months, you know, curling up next to a window and opening that window and letting the fresh breeze come in while you immerse yourself in this escape of a really wonderful book. And, um, you know, part of it is unplugging from our digital lives. You know, so often, even if we get a few minutes to take a break, you know, we'll flip on the television or maybe even we'll, you know, put on some music, which music is great. I'm not going to bash music, but, you know, anything that's kind of digitally connected is still kind of got us a little bit tied to those, you know, heightened stress levels where, Um, We're reacting sometimes either to the blue light emission or other things. So reading is one of those old fashioned analog, you know, pick up the book. Now, I know many of you, uh, obviously, you love audiobooks, which are great. And you also probably read off of your tablet. And I'm going to say that's okay, because we love reading. But really, there's something about a great book that you can feel and that just has that texture to it. I don't know. I'm just one of those book lovers. Now, I will say this, though. As we are helping our older parents or grandparents, tablets have become fantastic because they can, it's a lighter source. You know, sometimes these books are a little heavy or, you know, they're they're difficult if it's a paperback because if you've got arthritic hands, you can't read it as easily. Uh, we do know that there are large font books, particularly for people who have low vision and, you know, vision problems. But um, even the large books are sometimes hard to find and you can get, you know, you can find them in the bookstores or at libraries, but with a tablet, it's right there in your hand. It's lightweight. You know, you can kind of, you know, go through the pages as you would a normal book. You can increase the font with just your fingers. So I will say tablets have definitely opened the door, I think, for more of us to read into our 80s, 90s, and even our 100s. But let's talk about the design piece of this. So, you know, one of the things that is really important is uh, when we're thinking about these these nooks, it's not an extra room. It's not, uh, you know, I mentioned this last episode, it's not the she shed man cave kind of design. It's actually just a corner. And sometimes we have what they call a little bit of dead space in our uh, room designs where, you know, everything kind of has its place, but then you've got this one corner and it's kind of missing something. A lot of people like to go to biophilic design and they'll put a plant Uh, You can see even if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, you can see behind me, I've got a little bit of a dead space in my corner here in my office. So I've got a a very beautiful ficus um, tree behind me and, and on the side. But for those of us who might have one of these little cozy corners, that's where you can actually create your cozy reading nook. So here are the elements that you need. And it's pretty simple. First of all, you need a place that could be a little bit quiet. Hopefully you can get some of that quiet zone um, in your nook. Um, A comfy chair is really key, really important, something you can curl up on. Certainly good lighting because, you know, while we would love for you to have natural lighting from a window during the daytime, if you want to do your little escapism, you know, in the evening, you're going to need good task lighting. So that's really important. I've mentioned eye health before, and we know that from a vision standpoint, we need three times the light Um, at age 60 that we needed at age 20. So you really need to have good task lighting. Um, I like to also have reading socks. Now, here's something really interesting. You know, when we curl up, we often do think about, yes, let's take off our shoes, right? And even if you do this during the day and you say, I'm going to grab, you know, 15 minutes to read one chapter in my book. I want to see what happens next, you know, to my heroine or my hero or whatever. Um, Taking our shoes off is one of those elements that 
again, it, it puts us into a calm mode and, um, but it can be cold, right? So having a great pair of what we call reading socks, um, actually I bought mine and I don't like to do promos, but I bought mine at Barnes and Noble because they understand the reading sock, you know, um, people who need to have their socks on. Um, but you also want to have a place where you can store an extra pair of reading glasses. Um, I know a lot of us are searching for our reading glasses during the day, have a pair that's right there in your nook. Um, and then you need a small table so you can set maybe a you know, cup of tea, cup of coffee, maybe a nice beverage, you know, in the summer. Um, that and that becomes your little sanctuary. That becomes your cozy reading nook. Now, some things that we'll um I'm also writing an article on this. So we'll have a link on the episode guide page, but I want to give you some ideas. So for instance, if you have um, a book, a built-in bookshelf area, and we have pictures of this, by the way, some of these are really beautiful. You can actually do a built-in window seat into that bookshelf so that you've built in your little nook into your actual bookshelf. The books are right there that you might want to read or pull. You put a few throw pillows or a comfy cushion. And, um, you know, if you can do it next to a window, that's, you know, even better because you get that natural light during the day. Now, another idea are hammocks. And I've seen so so much in design trends, particularly last year and this year, where the rattan hammocks are inside. So they're kind of like these little pods and you can hang them in the corner of a bedroom or, you know, um, even a, a, a living room or den area or whatever. You can also have them outside. Of course, we love our hammocks that are outside um, so we can feel all that wonderful sun and breeze. But hammocks are a great little, you know, kind of reading nook idea. Um, underneath the stairs is another one. So there's a great photo that we have that shows, um, the application and design of this. So, you know, underneath our stairs, there's often, again, there's, there's this space. Some people use it for storage and extra, you know, closet space, but you can actually turn that into one of these cozy little nooks kind of reminds me of being a kid. I remember my brother and I, we used to go around the house or our grandparents' house looking for these little like almost like mini caves that were really just the cabinets that didn't have maybe anything in them. And we would love getting inside and kind of curling up, you know, and telling stories or whatever. So it kind of reminds me a little bit of that, that place underneath the staircase. Um, and then, you know, you can also create a quiet corner by a privacy screen. And some of these privacy screens out there now are so beautiful. So you just, you kind of put up your privacy screen when you're reading and then you can fold it back up and, you know, um, have it laying against the wall or whatever, when you're not, you can have a little do not disturb sign on there. So that makes it kind of fun. Um, also, Anything that, um, you know, you have a closet and maybe it's not really being used for coats or whatever, you can turn that into your little reading nook and that becomes really interesting. And then the classic reading nook is really a corner in our bedroom where we've got this comfy chair or chairs if you want to do a duo and uh, you know, where we can curl up hopefully next to some kind of a, a window or whatever. And that's actually where um, I have my reading nook and I'll just share with you. And I'm going to, I'm going to put some pictures up on um, our episode guide page, but my reading nook includes my chair is actually called the writer's chair. Uh, I bought it when I was writing my first book. It was kind of like my gift to myself and an incentive to get the book done. Um, but I really loved it. It was from Restoration Hardware. It's a not, it's a, just a beautiful, comfy leather chair. And then I have, you know, a, a cute little pillow. Um, I have my grandma, my great, great grandmother's quilt in case I get really cold. I've got my grandmother's steamer trunk that is right next to me. And that serves as my little side table. So I have a little lamp. Um, reading lamp on there, but I also have for inspiration, I have my grandmother's Royal typewriter from the 1930s that she, uh, she was a short story author. And every time I look at that, not only does it encourage me to write, but it encourages me to read as well. And then I've got my rotating library tower bookshelf right next to it. So that's my little reading nook. And it's really, it's small. It takes up just one little corner in my bedroom space, but it's kind of my little escape place. And when I get writer's block, or I'm having a really bad day, you know, I, I take at least 15 minutes and I go sit in my writer's chair with my reading socks on and get immersed in one of my favorite books. So uh, it really is a stress reliever. I think it's really great for caregivers to find a place where you can escape even for a few minutes a day and just, you know, let all of those worries kind of wash away 
um, as you, you know, as we mentioned in our caregiver wellness news, um, enhance your health through reading. And so with that, we're now going to go into this episode's Me Time Monday wellness hack on eating the rainbow, Mediterranean diets, the sunshine diet, and eating like the French. So here we are with the Me Time Monday wellness hack. I'm Sherry Snelling, and welcome to our Me Time Monday wellness hack. This episode's wellness hack is for March, which is National Nutrition Month, as well as National Color Therapy Month. We look at many hacks that will help you embrace food as fuel to keep your mind sharp and your body strong. So much of what makes us healthy and happy are the choices we make and food is no exception. We have long known that good nutrition is tied to energy, stamina, and overall good health. But we often don't think about how food is tied to our mental and emotional health. For some, indulging in is part of the reward center of the brain. We tell ourselves, if I do this, then I get a cookie or french fries. For others, it is part of the body and brain's stress response. We feel pressured, sad, or anxious, so we soothe our emotions with comfort food. This is why so many diet and nutrition services, from Weight Watchers to Noom, use psychological and behavioral science to moderate food intake and teach us more about how our brains work and why it is the key to healthful nutrition. It is all about our choices and the choices are in our heads, not in our stomachs. Since 2022 is our year of living colorfully here at Caregiving Club, our first hack for better brain and physical health is in to, is called Eat the Rainbow. What is great about visualizing the rainbow as you plan meals or decide what to eat You don't see whites, browns, or beiges, which are often the colors of packaged foods like cookies or potato chips. You see apples, tomatoes, oranges, bananas, green bell peppers, grapes, blueberries, and eggplant, all healthful and good for various brain and body functions. Each plant food contains many phytochemicals, vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients that work to improve our health. These antioxidants work to combat oxidative stress. That is the waste, also called free radicals, produced when the body uses oxygen that can damage cells. But the key is in the variety of these foods working together. Each phytochemical provides different health benefits. To maximize our health, we need a variety of colorful phytochemicals each day which we get by eating different colored fruits and vegetables. There's another benefit to eating six to seven servings of colorful vegetables and veggies every day. You also fill up faster and you chase away those hunger pains between meals. Not only does visualizing the rainbow keep you on track for the choices that you make to feel and perform better, it plays into something psychologists have studied for decades. And that is that fun leads to success. When you insert fun into a behavior or habit that is good for you, it increases the chance of making those choices or activities more healthful. When something is fun, we stick to it and eating the rainbow is no exception. Hack number two is to embrace a Mediterranean style diet. This was first published in the 1970s, and this style diet, though, didn't gain traction until the 1990s and was popularized in the book, The Blue Zones, Lessons on Living Longer from the People Who Have Lived the Longest. This book by Dan Bootner identified places around the globe who had higher percentages of centenarians, people who lived to 100 and beyond. One of their secrets to longevity was a Mediterranean style diet typically found in Greece and Italy in the 1960s. While the Blue Zones was not all about nutrition, in fact, um, intergenerational relationships, spirituality, and a sense of community play big parts in our living longer quests. Eating like they do in one of the Blue Zones, which is Sardinia, Italy, took hold and it became a diet guide that is still popular today. The basics of the Mediterranean diet are this, eat plenty of fruits, vegetables, bread, and other grains 
potatoes, beans, nuts, and seeds on a daily basis. Olive oil should be used as your primary fat source, but you can also tap into olives, avocados, and peanut butter for healthy fats. Also, dairy products, eggs, and fish, especially salmon, and poultry in low to moderate amounts you can eat weekly. And red wine is the only alcoholic beverage. And since life is about pleasure, the occasional treats are okay, and these include sweets and meats. Hack number three builds upon the ideas of the Mediterranean diet, and I call it the sunshine diet from my upcoming book, Me Time Monday, the weekly wellness edit. So what is the sunshine diet all about? Well, first, it's about vitamin D, known as the sunshine vitamin. This is necessary for the absorption of calcium, which plays a key role in maintaining our bone strength. However, up to 40% of US ref residents are deficient in vitamin D. If you eat a Mediterranean style diet with salmon, sardines, tuna, egg yolks, oatmeal and milk, or lactose free milk, if you're intolerant, I personally like almond milk, you'll get your daily vitamin D needs. Second, eat foods that are kissed by the sun. Again, think of the beautiful, sunny Mediterranean beaches and eat the fruits, berries, vegetables, and nuts that we associate with the Mediterranean. Some experts advise eating these foods with the skin intact since that is where the sun touched the fruit or vegetables and it carries the sunny nutrients to the inside food source. Lastly, eat during sunlight hours or what we call farmer's hours. It is the most efficient way to maintain or lose weight. Our metabolism is more efficient during daylight hours since it is tied to our circadian rhythms, which are our 24 seven sleep wake cycles. Eating after dark makes the body think it must stay awake since it takes a few hours to completely digest the food. Also eating during an eight to 10 hour daylight window means less time to consume more calories. And lastly, our last hack is in the same way the Mediterranean diet was known as the Greek paradox, where a diet high in fat, although it was good fat like olive oils, could reduce cardiovascular problems. Hack number four is to follow the French rules of dining, known as the French paradox. This method of eating is about freedom. You can eat whatever you like, including macaroons and magnificent sauces and the go-to for the three C's, mouth-watering croissants, cheese, and chocolate. However, you have to use these rules. Number one, eat small portions, or what we call baby bites. This helps you take many bites instead of stuffing your face. It also helps to avoid choking as we often don't chew each bite enough. The Cleveland Clinic advises chewing each bite 15 to 30 times. And when we're in a hurry, we simply just don't chew. And along with baby bites, think about small portions or portion control. So you can have one chocolate, not 10. The best practice is to use your salad plate as your dinner plate. Number two in the French eating diet is to eat socially. Now, if you're solo, you can do people watching like Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald did in their favorite 1920s Paris cafes. But what we know is if you eat and talk, you are more likely to eat less. A study in Japan showed those who eat slower are less obese. And also, from our first hunger pains to satiation, which means we're feeling full, takes about 20 minutes. Our brains need that long to process that we no longer need more food. So ideally, meals should last about 30 to 60 minutes. And if you have conversation between bites and no smartphone activity, this helps. Number three, you also want to hydrate while eating. Now, wine is fine, even in daytime, but no more than four ounces, which is a little under half of a typical wine glass per meal. And sip water after every bite. And number four, just like the French, be fashionable. 
try not, not to eat in your sweats. If you are dressed for work or going outside to run errands, then you will take more care and eat more slowly. And you'll stop sooner because your pants won't expand. And no eating in the car ever. Have fruit or a protein bar in your purse or glove compartment. So if you have to miss a meal, you can get something a little bit more nutritious. We hope this nutritional Me Time Monday wellness hack helps you live and eat colorfully. Each episode of our Caregiving Club on air podcast features a new Me Time Monday wellness hack. You can also learn more about the Me Time Monday program and workshop at caregivingclub.com and check out my wellness articles for my upcoming book, Me Time Monday, the weekly wellness edit for a wonderful life. Take care and stay well. I hope you enjoyed our National Nutrition and National Reading Month episode. Please listen to us on Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts and other listening channels. Check out all the resources and article links on our episode guide page at caregivingclub.com backslash podcast. And email us at podcast at caregivingclub.com with any questions or comments. Take care and stay well.